McLaren are doing something very unusual with their suspension. In fact, they might not be using it at all. They just weren't in Austria in dominant fashion. While everyone else's tyres cooked, McLaren stayed perfect for the entire race distance. And this is their big advantage. So I decided to investigate what's really going on. For months, the paddock's been buzzing with increasingly wild theories about why they're so fast. The most outlandish was that McLaren was somehow injecting water into their Pirelli tyres to create some kind of internal cooling system. And there was a theory, which we covered on Driver61, that they were using phase change materials to slow the heating of the tyres from the braking system. These are materials that melt and solidify at certain temperatures, potentially absorbing excess heat when tyres get too hot, keeping them within the perfect window. Red Bull even used thermal cameras to capture McLaren's brake drums, and they saw cold spots, something that shouldn't be possible. And this sparked even more theories. Secret cooling fluids, exotic materials, hidden air ducts. The teams were convinced McLaren had found some cooling trick hidden in their brake ducts. But after multiple FIA investigations, including inspections after Miami, they found McLaren's systems to be legal but clever. Of course, there's still a real chance McLaren are doing something very clever to keep their tyre temps cool. But there's also something else very clever going on with another part of the car the suspension. McLaren are using suspension that might not even dive. It might not even compress down at the front when the driver's on the brakes. And if it does, it's only just a little bit. But why on earth would you want that? Well, it all comes down to where these cars generate their speed. Modern F1 cars create most of their downforce from the floor, the massive aerodynamic surface underneath the car that works like an upside down wing. The closer you can keep this massive wing to the ground without actually touching and choking off the air, the better. And at a constant speed with no turning, this is easy. But unfortunately for engineers, race circuits have corners, which means you need to brake, turn and accelerate. How annoying. So let me show you what actually happens. Here we can see a normal formula car and then when it gets on the brakes it dives. Watch how the nose drops down and the rear lifts up. When the car pitches forward like this the floors angle to the ground and the distance to the ground changes. So the carefully designed airflow underneath the car gets disrupted. The whole floor is working in a less efficient way. And suddenly you might have lost loads of downforce, all while at the most important part of the corner, the entry. But McLaren have changed their suspension geometry to create an ultra stable aerodynamic platform under braking to keep that gap at the front of the floor the same, even when the car is braking and should be diving at the front. And so they're keeping the aerodynamics of the floor working almost perfectly. Now, this isn't entirely new thinking. Teams have tried to solve this problem before. Back in the 80s and in another effort to keep a floor in its perfect position, Williams tried a car with solid suspension and Lotus tried with the legendary Type 88 with its twin chassis system, which is probably the most simple and genius F1 car ever and a car I got to see a few weeks ago. The video will be out soon. But the idea of both of these cars was to keep that huge underfloor wing in its most efficient state and a constant distance from the ground. So how exactly have McLaren gone about trying to do this? Well, first off, they've gone absolutely mad with their front suspension geometry. What they've done is create what's called extreme anti-dive. And to be clear, this isn't a recent development. The car's been more or less like this from the beginning of the season, but it's still incredibly interesting. By the way, if you're interested in incredible engineering like this, join our engineering newsletter where I share insights from all of the F1 teams and race teams that I get to visit. Link in the description. So first, let's understand what anti-dive actually is and how it works, because it's more clever than just angling some suspension arms. Take a look at this F4 car. The yellow dots are where the wishbones attach to the chassis. Its wishbone setup runs roughly parallel to the ground. And in this car, there's no anti-dive. So when you brake, all of those braking forces from the tires get transmitted horizontally back through the chassis. There's no geometric advantage here. The springs and dampers have to deal with all the weight transfer on their own, which is what causes the nose to dive. But here's where the engineering gets really clever. Anti-dive works through something called the instant center. And this is key to understanding the whole system. So what's the instant center? Well, if you extend lines through your wishbone mounting points, they meet at the instant center. In a parallel setup, that instant center is way out there at almost infinity. And one thing to know here before we go any further, 
is that anti-dive doesn't actually reduce the total amount of weight transfer under braking. Physics is physics. In a Formula 1 car, there's still roughly 300 kilograms shifting from the rear to the front. That isn't going anywhere. But what anti-dive does is change how that weight transfer gets managed. Instead of all of that load going through the springs and causing compression, the geometry redirects some of those braking forces directly through the suspension links themselves. The wishbones, the chassis mounting points, all that hard structure, taking all of that braking load. Now, you might have heard a percentage amount regarding the amount of anti-dive. Most teams sit at somewhere between 30 and 60%. But what exactly does that mean? So again, we find the instant center by drawing a line through the pickup points of the top and bottom wishbones. Then we find the height of the center of gravity. Here, I'm just guessing for the purposes of this explanation, but obviously the teams would know this precisely. Then you draw a line up from the tires contact patch through the instant center and the point at which this passes through the vertical of the center of gravity is the anti-dive percentage. Here it's roughly 40%. But here's where McLaren have gone really extreme. In this example, I actually moved the rear pickup point of the upper wishbone up a bit. But if you look at this image, this is more like what McLaren have actually done. They've positioned the rear mounting point of the upper wishbone way down compared to where you'd normally expect. And this creates a really steep angle on that upper arm, much more extreme than most of the other teams. What this does is bring that instant center much closer to the front of the car, creating what's called extreme anti-dive geometry. And this means that instead of managing just some of the weight transfer through the wishbones, McLaren are managing a massive amount, probably close to all of it. So with McLaren getting close to 100% anti-dive, that means virtually no suspension compression under braking. The springs barely move. All that energy is being reacted through the suspension structure itself. So the result is that when the McLaren drivers hit the brakes, that force doesn't compress the springs. Rather, it has an upward reaction force through the suspension geometry that makes the car stay flat, which in turn keeps the aerodynamic platform stable and the floor working efficiently. Instead of a relatively gentle spring compression absorbing that 300 kilograms of weight transfer, you're now forcing all of that energy through the wishbones, the mounting points and the chassis structure. And there is a massive trade-off for the drivers and it's one that really affected Lando Norris. It makes the car feel numb, which makes it harder to drive on the limit. In fact, it makes it harder to feel where that limit actually is. Lando was complaining about this with the car a lot. He said it didn't have the feel that the previous year's McLaren had. The problem is that when you resist the car's natural tendency to pitch, you're also removing that crucial feedback that the drivers rely on. They can't feel what the front tires are doing. When a car normally dives, you have a good idea of how it's biting into the track. But with this, apparently, you can't feel much at all. Norris described it as losing a deep connection with the car, especially on the corner entry, where feel is everything and where you can lose a ton of time. Now, most teams would probably tell their drivers to adapt, but McLaren created a bespoke front suspension geometry just for Lando. At the Canadian Grand Prix, they re-angled the upper wishbone mounting to the upright and modified the kingpin inclination. You can see the difference on Giorgio Piola's beautiful image here. Norris's upper wishbones are slightly thicker and have a different bend in them compared to Oscar's. By the way, you should check out Giorgio's work. It's incredible and linked below. So McLaren essentially created two slightly different cars for their drivers. One optimized purely for aerodynamic performance and another one that helped the drivers feel. And Piastri actually chose to stick with the initial system saying he was happy with how the car had been so far this year and he preferred the consistency. But Andrea Stella downplayed the performance difference saying it was more about the preferential aspects of how the drivers drive the car rather than any increase in grip. But aside from the aero, there's another benefit, the tires. We know that modern F1 tires only work well at certain temperatures. Too cold and they provide minimal grip, too hot and they very quickly get worse with blistering and graining. And we know that the McLaren is very good on its tires. And this suspension setup probably is helping them. 
With a normal suspension setup, when a car pitches under braking, the amount of downforce is constantly changing, and so is the load on the tires. These load changes cause temperature spikes in the tires themselves, and this means the tires are more easy to overheat during a stint. But because the McLaren is more consistent with that gap at the front of the floor, the downforce is more consistent, and it has smaller spikes in load through its tires, meaning that it's better over a stint. Now, of course, McLaren's performance isn't down to one single element or trick. It's how all of their development works together to give the car loads of grip and be kind to its tires. Now, I mentioned the theory about McLaren using phase change materials in their brake drums, and it's a fascinating concept. So if you haven't watched that video yet, check it out just here. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.